So welcome everybody to episode 163 today, actually, of Level Up, which is 60 minutes, of course, of live Q&A, where your questions and votes really do drive the show. Adriana and Shanice today are both over in the social chat, so do please let them know your name and, of course, the city from where you're joining. They're going to post some links in so that you can vote up the questions that you would most like answered and, of course, for you to be able to add your own as well. If your question's selected, then your name is going to appear in the credits at the end of the show. So do get those questions in early and stay with us to see all of that happening. Now, today is a little bit of an experiment. We've got to episode 163, so you would kind of think we're over with the experimentation. But today we're introducing the electronic hand raise for all of our panellists to be able to use. So from that point of view, you will see this little symbol popping up from time to time in the panel view so that that's just indicating to you that the panellists are raising their hand in the traditional way um, to indicate that they're happy to be able to answer the question that you have put to them. All right, very good. Now, today we're going to be talking about one of the most rewarding careers available to people in the workplace, which, in my opinion, which is about helping others acquire skills and confidence that they will need to fulfil their own potential. In different countries and in different cultures, we tend to use different terms or labels, job descriptions and so on for um, for these roles. But whatever the term that you use to describe it, professional educators really do change lives. They change outcomes for people. Um, for their teams and for their organizations for the better. Joining us today, we have a fantastic panel of experts to help us understand much better how to become a trainer and how to develop your career in professional education and training. And um, they have all practiced extensively in these roles. So let's jump in straight away and meet them. Bev Andrews, first of all, of course, you'll remember, she's a director over at Aspire Change Management in Western Australia. Her work has taken her, I think it's fair to say, to work across industries and time zones. She's passionate about nurturing people, coaching and mentoring them. And she's a real inspiration for me personally and for many people as well who she has worked with in her career. So welcome back to Level Up, Bev. Great to have you on the panel. Thank you, Nick. And uh, welcome, everybody. I'm really looking forward to uh, tonight's session. So thank you. Thank you so much indeed. Rachel Jenkins, she also joins us. She's a consultant, of course, over with Provac Limited, and she's specialised in a whole variety of different things through her career, but notably excelling in complex integrations and transformation delivery. Um, As a leadership coach and mentor, Rachel is often championing um, how project management offices, PMOs in organisations, can become a real hub for professional development and the enablement of individuals and teams. Welcome back, Rachel. Lovely to have you on the panel as well. Hello, Nick. Uh, Great to be back. And hi, everybody. Thanks for uh, joining us all this afternoon. I'm really looking forward to today's show. Um, I'll be obviously talking about PMOs. I always do. But my other passion, obviously, is training and, you know, really helping people learn and and make the best of their, their opportunities. Okay, brilliant. Thanks so much indeed, Rachel. Mark, Mark Kamenoven is a freelance trainer and coach, uh, and I think it's fair to say with an entrepreneurial flair. He's built his career across a wide range of project, program, and portfolio best practice. He's an author in his own right and a strong contributor to a wide variety of professional communities. Welcome back to Level Up, Mark. Brilliant to have you. Thanks, Nick. Um, Always Good to get back here. Um, I found out that I'm a trainer in my career. So I just love facilitating (laughs) people development. Absolutely, absolutely. And thank you. And I think we're going to get into that because many of us have kind of, you know, we found something that we're very good at and we do more and more of it. And that's a fabulous thing to be able to see and to recognize. Um, Sitting alongside Mark is John Miller. He coaches and, of course, was appointed as well as an assessor to apprentices studying here in the UK. In the UK, we have something called a level four apprenticeship qualification, and this particular discipline is in project management. Um, Before retraining for his role, he worked in the public sector 
gaining valuable experience and insight and took up the challenge of obtaining a teaching degree um, in his 60s. So um, really interesting. Thank you, Mark. Really great to welcome you back to Level Up. Great to see you all again, Nick. We're looking forward to all the questions as ever this afternoon. Okay, thank you so much. Completing our panel today is Mark Rovers. He is, of course, the president over at Interprom, who in both Europe and the USA deliver leadership, coaching, and a whole variety of teaching and training to their clients from the C-suite down to the individual contributor. Um, his background, of course, is varied, but it has centered around communities as well, and particularly so in service management. Um, he builds effective teams and really does focus on obtaining a better outcome for every client. So welcome back to the show, Mart. Brilliant to have you with us today. Well, thank you, Nick. Thank you, APMG, for having me. And thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Uh, I've seen some great questions have already come in. I'd like to start off with a quote from Eris Total to get us going. He once said, those who know, do. Those who understand, teach. Aha, a much better variant on the much misquoted <laughs> version um, that we often hear as educators. So lovely. Thank you so much, Martin. It's got my vote straight away. So um, brilliant uh, to have you on the panel. Thank you so much indeed. Completing our on-camera team today is, of course, our question master, Charlotte Miller. She's joining us from the Thames Valley here in the UK. Um, Charlotte, a warm welcome to you. Is it is it warm in the UK? Would you, has summer finally arrived here? Yeah, I think we're on our sixth day of our allowance of sunny days here in the UK at the moment. <laughs> okay. All right. Very good. Very good. Well, um, who knows? Six days in the UK. Actually, that can make a summer. That could be an entire summer. But we'll wait and see. We'll see what happens um, over the coming weeks. Um, so very good. Now, look, I can see a huge number of people who are joining us online. So very warm welcome to you all from a whole variety of different cities and countries. Thank you so much for putting them in. I've already seen Peter join us from Chicago, which is uh, over in the US, wow. uh, the Windy City, as it used to be known. Uh, I don't know if it still is, actually. But anyway, um, welcome very much, Peter. Brilliant to have you online today. So thank you for joining us. And um, a couple of other folks um, that I can see as well. Lucas is joining us from Cobham in Surrey. So we're going to drag you away from watching the ladies' ashes test today. Um, Lucas, <laughs> if you're following the cricket, my friend. And actually, we probably won't talk about cricket, Bev. We're going to dive straight into the questions <laughs> and um, let's get going, Charlotte. Um, how to be a trainer um, is the theme for today's episode. So let's have our first question, please. Thanks, Nick. Hands up already. Uh, question is from Kevin in Scotland in the UK. Can anyone be a trainer? Okay. All right. Thank you very much indeed. Mark, why don't you start us off and then we'll hear from Rachel. Hi, Kevin. Uh, a great question. Uh, the short answer is no. We need trainees as well. And uh, not everybody has the, <laughs> the skill to do it, the, the, the energy to do it, uh, uh, wants to help others out in specific areas. Uh, you can't train in every area. You need to have some experience as well. So, short answer, no. <laughs> Absolutely. It's great advice. If there's somebody who's facilitating the teaching on the other side of the scales, that has to, somebody has to be learning something, don't they? And if they're not, by the way, if they're not, by the way, then you may want to consider how, how is it actually going. Um, Rachel, your thoughts on this one, please. Can anybody become a trainer? Um, I think anyone can become a trainer, but not everybody should. Um, I think if you really don't like giving presentations, you don't like standing up in front of people, that's your idea of hell, then you are not really going to enjoy the whole process of being a trainer. However, if you are, you know, really curious about people, um, you know, love to have interaction with people, um, share your knowledge, uh, see people grow, see people develop, then yes, you know, training is for you. Um, and if it is for you and you have got the right sort of aptitudes for it, then nothing should stop you becoming a trainer. If you're passionate for it, do it. 
Okay, excellent, good point, really there, because um, you know we we you do need a certain amount of wanting to be mm-hmm. the focus of attention. You know, um, if you're going to be in the kind of leadership position for teaching and learning, then th- there's going to be a lot of attention on you, and if you're uncomfortable in that, then it might not be the best choice. Um, Bev, your thoughts. Thank you, Rachel. Excellent, um, Bev. Your thoughts on this one. Thank you, Rachel. I I, um, I agree with you. And uh, my thoughts with training is, it's a bit like um, being a, being an actor and being out on stage. You know, you're you're mm-hmm. out in the front there. Um, you're in real life, so you have to be able to think on your feet. You need to be able to. Um, 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 respond quickly to, to questions and maybe some difficult learners. Not everybody that comes into a learning session, a training session, is actually there because they want to learn. Sometimes they've been sent in there mm-hmm. um, and it's seen more as a punishment than actually a reward. So um, you do need to actually want to be up the front, as Rachel said, and um, be able to put a good show on for people so that they actually mm-hmm. embrace what you're saying and the knowledge that you're sharing. It, it, it's so vital, isn't it? Our energy level as the facilitator of the learning affects everybody else. So if we are, you know, the training tigger, if I can use that um, character from the Winnie the Pooh book, you know, and we're full of energy and vitality, then the chances are others will rise to match our energy level. So really fantastic, great start. Great question, by the way, to get the show going. Ishmael has joined us. Um, thank you so much. Great to have you online today. Not sure where in the world you're coming from but um, really good to have you with us uh, Christian uh, joins us from Warsaw we have a huge following over in Poland um, so thank you very much for joining us today and Julian um, well I am a little jealous my friend uh, joining us from Spain as it's a very beautiful country mm-hmm. and the food well is absolutely marvellous and then Zia is joining us as well uh, from Afghanistan so really great to have you online and we have two Julians we have at least two actually online today so uh, Johannesburg Julian I'll refer to you in that way my friend uh, really brilliant to have you in the chat now don't forget if you are joining us in the audience all that you need to do is type your question in and the social team will pick it up and we'll bring it into the panel and then of course we will mention you in the credits at the end of the show so with that in mind charlotte let's take our next question please thanks nick we've got a live question that's just been submitted to um someone that by someone that i think quite a few people know tanya van diecke what is the most effective and quickest way to get started as a successful trainer if you have no or limited experience as a trainer Okay, excellent. Mart, why don't you start us off, please? And then we're going to hear from John. Okay, not to be too uh, boring here, but John Maxwell once said, students don't care how much you uh, know until they know how much you care. Uh, So I think uh, that's one of the things you should portray, that you care about what you're teaching. Uh, So show Mm -hmm. that passion. Uh, I mean, that'll definitely give you a jump start. Uh, even if you don't have uh, experience as a trainer, that level of excitement will radiate. I, I completely agree with that, you know, and, and showing that empathy that you care not just about the subject matter, but also about the way in which you communicate that across to people and engage them in that learning experience. It's vital, isn't it, to build that bridge, you know, and really get people thinking actively, actively present in the learning experience, really super important. Um, John, your thoughts on this, please? And then we're going to go to Bev. Sure, just to say there are quite a lot of training courses that large organizations run that are regulatory in nature, such as data protection. And maybe if you're worried about getting into things that you're passionate about, perhaps start off with some regulatory courses like data protection where there's a fairly established thing that you could get into, establish lesson plans that you could use and give you a bit of confidence in just getting you started. That would be a good way of doing it. It, it really is. And and therefore in that you have, you know, with great power and you have great power, I think, and you, when you're leading, you know, a class of people um, comes that great responsibility, doesn't it? it? It's not up to us 
to cut corners. It's up to us to ensure that the whole curriculum is covered and that we differentiate our approach so that everybody in the classroom learns to the very best of their ability. So really good point, John. It's a great place to start where you can kind of feel the edges. There's a framework within which, you know, you're actually being asked um, to work. So very good. Thank you very much indeed. Um, let's go to Bev next and then we'll hear from Mark. Thanks, Nick. Um, my thoughts are um, a, a little bit different in that if you actually are working in an organisation already that does have um, a, a training team or a couple of trainers, um, I'd go and speak to them and um, ask how they got to where they got to. Um, and if you were actually able to, um, in your own time, so maybe some discretionary time and, and work that through with your team, um, just see if you can actually go and sit in some of their training sessions and observe them. Um, if it's in, if it's topics that you actually are comfortable, whether they'd let you even have a go at um, co-facilitating an activity. So a bit like with teachers and their teacher assistants, seeing if you can actually take over and, and run a small activity with the group so you can actually get a little mm -hmm. bit of hands-on um, experience in a safe environment. So you can actually see if, well, it looks good on the outside. Is it actually really for me? Um, and then the other thing I'd think about is in your local um, communities, there's usually a lot of, um, um, you know, associations or groups where uh, trainers actually hang out, you know, whether that be virtually or in person. And um, joining those communities enables you to actually build some relationships and ask questions and um, uh, gather some more information around, well, what's going to work for you in your situation? Yeah, absolutely right. That kind of, you know, joining in, getting a coach, getting a mentor. And by the way, it's always good to pick somebody who's really good at it. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, it does help. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it kind of helps, doesn't it, really? Because it's sort of like, um, you, you know, if you, if you sit down next to somebody and they, they, they teach you all of their bad habits, that's not great. But if you do sit with somebody who's inspiring, who's just exciting to be with, you know, and whatever the subject matter is, it's like, wow, you know, wow, that is amazing. Mm. Then that's the most fantastic thing. So totally agree with you there. And, and get just jump in. You know, just jump in and take part, as you say, Bev. Great advice there. Um, Mark, final thoughts on this one, then we'll move on. Yeah, I agree with the point Bev made. Um, but don't forget, as a trainer, you're facilitating learning. So what about facilitating stuff? It could be within your own community, it could be within your own uh, company, if you work in a company. Um, facilitate the next meeting. That will help Absolutely. you build Absolutely. more experience. Yeah. Yeah, completely right. And, you know, volunteering, putting yourself forward, even if you feel, you know, slightly uncomfortable about it, it's a practice. Uh, you know, this kind of work comes with practice and you gain your confidence in little Lego brick sized chunks at a time. You know, nobody comes to this with a feeling that they they are fully in control. You will feel from time to time like you've swallowed a breeze block. It's a very English expression, but one of those big uncomfortable bricks that they that they build houses out of. All right. So um you may feel a little uncomfortable like that, but in time that fades away and it's replaced by the delightful feeling that you are able to engage others in that learning experience. So really very good. Thank you, Mark. Excellent. Let's move on, Charlotte. I can see that we've got lots of questions kind of stacking up, um, both pre-submitted into Slido and also from the audience online as well. Thanks, Nick. We've got a question, another question from Kevin in Scotland. <laughs> Kevin asks, is the future likely to continue with online virtual classroom delivery or return to a physical classroom training environment? And if so, how do I, do I develop my skills in both delivery formats? All right. Excellent question. Thank you, John. Um, so, Rachel, why don't you start us off and then we will hear from, uh, thank you, Kevin, rather. Uh, Rachel, start us off and then we'll hear from John. Uh, so yes, Kevin, um, really good question. 
So my view on this is I think both um, will remain um, and we will have to become skilled at delivering in both ways. Uh, I think people and particularly companies have realized, you know, how convenient virtual training can be in terms of not having to bring loads of people traveling long distances. But we have at Provec also seen people wanting to return to having face-to-face delivery um, because there are benefits to both. I think if um, you want to develop skills, particularly in that virtual format, um, I think you need to think about um, how much, it's not impossible, but it's a little bit harder to get that rapport. So you have to try a little bit harder at that when you're not sort of face-to-face. And you have to think about how you, some of the tools and techniques you'd use in face-to-face, such as jumping up and using a flip chart. Um, Think about maybe how you can just put a Word document up and share it and type into that. Mm -hmm. Um, If you like to sort of draw pictures and, and diagram what people are saying you know get some sort of kind of notepad paint thing and share that and draw it with a stylus so think about all of those engagement tools that you would use face to face and how you can transfer that to virtual Um, because there's a real danger with virtual I think that you can just end up reading off powerpoints and you have to work really hard at engaging your audience questions discussions lots of breakout lots of feedback Um, both are here to stay and I think it's absolutely worth developing your skills in virtual as well. Thank you very much, Rachel. Some brilliant hints and tips there. And I think we're going to return to some of those in a few moments. Uh, John, your thoughts, then we'll hear from Bev. I'm really not sure I can improve on the answer that uh, uh, that (laughs) Rachel's just given. But uh, what I would say is that I think both are here to stay very firmly because we have a, a new world of work where a lot of my learners have a day a week where they work at home and they prefer to put some learning into that day. Uh, also, if you've got shift work or family responsibilities, that's caring or looking at young children, uh, virtual is, is more convenient. But as Rachel was saying, there are snags with virtual delivery. How do you keep people engaged? You know, some of my students turn off their cameras, so I don't know if they're listening to me, for example. So it's breaking up putting assessments in, putting different forms of technology in, which keeps them engaged. Use the chat box like we're doing today, but just keep that interaction with people is very important. Yeah, it's so, so, so important, isn't it, to, you know, to always remember that that um, it's not us giving the information that's important. It's, it's how the information is being received and processed and, you know, actually ingested, you know, and acted upon. That's the most important part of it. You know, less can be more in training and education so long as the learner is in receiver mode. Um, mm-hmm. So let's move on if we can. Bev, your thoughts on this, and then we'll hear from Mart. Um, definitely both are, are here to stay. Um What's hard with your virtual learning, as um, my colleagues are pointing out, is being able to make it interactive. And uh, one of the bigger challenges that you have with virtual is um, you don't get to be able to read as easily the body language Mm -hmm. and the energy in the room as you do in a classroom. So um, you do need to make sure that you're paying attention to the... um, uh, the facial expressions of people to sort of look for, you know, if they're fatigued, if they're bored, if, if you're going too slow, if you're going too fast, do they look a little bit like, oh, I'm, I'm not keeping up. Um, and also it's exhausting actually learning virtually and staring at a machine the whole time as well. So whilst you can't sort of get people up and down and, and moving around and engaging in groups because your breakouts tend to be online as well, um, but you certainly need to make sure that you might need to build in extra small uh, little breaks to mm. keep the energy going um, or just have some sort of like more a uh, non-technical conversations to sort of stim- stimulate um, people's minds and keep their energy and engagement going. Yeah, excellent advice there, particularly around, you know, the architecting of that learning experience online. So mm. thank you very much mm. indeed, uh, Bev. Mark, your thoughts, please. Uh, great answers indeed so far. Um, And I had to throw this one in from Robert Frost, who says, I'm not a teacher, but I'm an awakener, and definitely for the folks uh, learning online, right? But anyway, um, what I found, one thing that I think hasn't been mentioned yet is um, the power of storytelling, which is Mm -hmm. enormously helpful, uh, whether you do it online or in person. Uh, That technique, uh, if you can call it uh, a technique, is something that is uh, useful in both uh, scenarios, both formats. 
highly uh, recommend going that route. Yeah, it's it's such an important part of the way that people learn. You know, from throughout history, spoken history was was the way in which people figured out which plants to eat. <laughs> they were nice, and then other ones <laughs> were not so nice. You know, and so on. So sharing that information and communicating is really really important. Storytelling is a very powerful way to aid people's retention of knowledge, and. The illustration of application of understanding through metaphor is indeed a great way to be able to help engage people in that storytelling process as well. And one thing that I would say in answer to this question about developing skills is that you will find a lot of people who are teaching online today have not made that full transition. But what they're doing is they're re regurgitating instructional design principles from the 1950s into their online teaching and learning. And it's really suboptimal to do that. What I would suggest is get some time together, start researching what does good look like in online education and training. Mm -hmm. Think about immersive learning. Look at some of the pioneers who are using immersive audio, who are using scenarios and situations who are facilitating learning and um, give the feedback to the trainer if they're reading the slides that you can read faster than they can speak because we need to encourage everybody to elevate their game from what they're doing today to what is actually needed in the future. Look at the way that people use things like YouTube and are able to deliver outstanding um, pieces of learning in the short format. <laughs> so just have a little think uh, about what that might be. Uh, we might come back to some of those tools and techniques in the future. So great answers panel. Thank you very much indeed. And a wonderful question, Kevin, to get us into the nitty gritty, if you like, of the delta you know, between the physical world and also the virtual world. Charlotte, let's move on. We'll take our next question, please. Thanks, Nick. We've got a live question from Peter, Peter, Peter Tessin, a LinkedIn live viewer. Trainers are people with deep technical knowledge. How can technical experts improve their audience engagement skills to keep students listening and engaged? Ah, oh, yes. Well, here, here is the excited, you know, kind of technical <laughs> experts <laughs> deeply diving into what they find exciting. The poor, the poor class is kind of lagging behind. <laughs> so, Mark, start us off, and then we'll hear from Rachel. How do you manage to do? Because you do this, you both do this amazingly well. How how would you go about it? I, I live on interaction. I thrive on interaction. That's the energy mm. I give and I get back. And the rest of the answer you already gave, Martin. Nick. Use storytelling, explain how you use all those technical knowledge mm -hmm. and why you need it in your regular job. And you already said you need to engage. So short bits of technical knowledge, technical theory, and then uh, uh, try to have some uh, a video because when you're online, then they can look at later on or before in a practice. So that's basically it. Use more interaction. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mark. And, um, you know, I completely agree with that. You you can either tell people stuff or you can ask really great questions. And if you ask really great questions, the chances are that they will help you understand where their gap in the knowledge actually is. And that will help you bring a laser focus to that learning moment. So fantastic approach. Thank you, Mark. Um, Rachel, your thoughts? Then we'll hear from Bev. Um, yeah, so similar um, thoughts myself, um, you know, lots of interaction. Um, and I think almost um, kind of uh, bizarrely for a trainer, have those interactive sessions, but be prepared to talk less and listen more, which seems at odds with mm. what we do as a trainer. So if you're going to have discussion, ask questions and then just be silent and let people ask those questions. Let people start that discussion. And then as you know, mm. both of you have said before, that power of storytelling, you know, you bring that technical theory to life with your experience. Um, so let people ask um, questions of you wanting to know what you've done in the past and use that to bring that learning to life. And people will engage with that and people will remember a story far more than just pure technical knowledge. You have a huge amount to offer when you're a technical expert in what you're delivering. 
Yeah, it's absolutely true. And if you are genuinely expert, you should feel comfortable, mm. not with dumbing down. I don't agree with that phrase, actually. The phrase mm. that I would use is to differentiate, all right? If you are genuinely the expert, you should be able to help um, somebody and understand where they're up to. When a child learns to play the piano, every note is full volume. The tune is simplified and every note comes mm. out at full volume. Bong, bang, bing, bong, bing, bang, bong. <laughs> and there's a wonderful video online from a TED talk and it's from a conductor and he talks about one buttock piano playing. When you understand the music and the nuance and the tone you're able to get from the instrument means that the pianist actually rolls around on the seat of the instrument as they're playing it and they move from cheek to cheek because they're so immersed in that. And you should be able to differentiate between the child who is learning and the concert pianist who you are coaching. And that's the delightful moment. So thank you, Rachel. Brilliant um, answer. Uh, Bev, your thoughts, please, on this. Um, so my thoughts very much are, um, regardless of the topic, whether it's a technical um, training session or, or, you know, more of a, a soft skill learning session, um, it's very much around your facilitation skills and that ability to be able to lis listen um, and provide diverse learning um, uh, activities for people. So mix it up a little bit, give them opportunities where they can have discussions, you know, whether that be in small groups, uh, opportunities to think, opportunities to, um, to actually try something, you know, put a, put a, a scenario forward, um, give them some problems to try to solve potentially. Um, uh, don't teach people to, to suck eggs. If, they, if they've come in to have a look at some technical um, learning from you, um, you know, give them some of those quirky things that happen as well that get them to think a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, you've just got to be, you've just got to put variety in there, variety of tools um, and variety of things for people to actually do and absorb because we do um, have have our preferences on how we actually do take on knowledge and and. Uh, new information. Thank you so much indeed. And, um, you know, I absolutely agree with all of that. One little book that folks might like to read from the audience, uh, I think it's still available on uh, a whole variety of different bookshops and in audio format, is by a gentleman who I much admire, Sir Ken Robinson. He was um, a really interesting um, person. Uh, he worked um, advising UK government, actually, on how to ensure that we change change the state education system to address the industry need. Industry ask for adults to be more innovative, to be more creative, and yet our education system is built like a factory mm. where your most important attribute is your date of manufacture. So regardless of your learning style, you go through the same order of events in a sequence as everybody else does. And his argument was that if you want people to be creative in work, then you need to nurture that creativity. Everybody under the age of seven can draw you a picture of their family. When we start to develop in Piaget's terms beyond into the abstract world, we become more self-critical and our state education system often squishes creativity out um, to replace it with uniformity. And I would suggest mm. to you as an employer, you need to find the creative in everybody. It's not only marketing mm. people who are creative. <laughs> everybody is creative. We have creative <laughs> people who are working in manufacturing, in design, in finance, in law, in a whole range of professional disciplines. Find the inner creative in your team, unleash their potential and amazing things will follow. Excellent, very good indeed. Thank you so much, panel. Let's move on if we can. Charlotte, we'll take our next question, please. Thanks, Nick. We've got a live question from Julian on LinkedIn. And Julian asks, what group dynamics for knowledge consolidation are foreseen for online training in a virtual classroom that can help the trainer and create homogeneity. 
All right. So this is a really good question because sometimes you're teaching groups of people who are distributed uh, physically around the world, and they may have different cultural backgrounds, and they may have different um, uh, ways of learning as well. So, um, John, you, you do a lot of this. Let's start with you, and then we'll hear from Mart. I think it's the way you design your lessons. So if you do a lesson on a particular subject with group exercises, then you could set Let's call it homework, not a fashionable term, but let's call it mm -hmm. something you've got to do your next lesson. And then you could have a session at the start of the next lesson to say, let's recap. Let's say, what do we, what do we all get out of that particular subject? It forms a foundation stone where you're clear that learners have got a good level of understanding of that topic and are safe to move on to the next one. If there's still a lot of mm -hmm. doubt and uncertainty, stick with that one until you've, 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 you've nailed it for everyone, because everyone learns at a different rate. And then move on, mm -hmm. but be flexible, because not everyone learns at the same rate, and people are very different, one with each other. And I, I just want to emphasize, John, I, I think you've said something really insightful there, which is that feedback loop. We need feedback loops. We need to understand how people are actually learning, the rate at which they're acquiring that understanding and so on. If we don't have that feedback, then, you know, particularly over longer periods of study, you get horribly out of sync, can't you? So really good advice. Thank you. Mm -hmm. March, your thoughts, please. What I usually look for is what are the common challenges that students face are faced with and um, have my conversations, discussions, or interactions uh, evolve around those. I mean, that brings them together as in, I'm not the only one uh, with this uh, problem or uh, opportunity, um, but uh, there's more people like me. And once they notice as in, hey, we're all in this together and we're all facing the same challenges, then you'll see that uh, you get a lot more interactions, people open up as in uh, becoming a little bit more vulnerable. And that to me helps enormously, uh, whether it's uh, virtual or in person, uh, to get that uh, hey, we're, uh, commonality going, homogeneity going either way, that uh, helps with the dynamics of the class. Yeah, I agree with that. There's a lot of um, kind of team theory that's available to you. Um, so do have a look at some of the um, psychologists who have worked in uh, high performing teams. Uh, Belbin, Meredith Belbin, I think was his name. Um, mm -hmm. He did some really good work um, by taking groups of people who were studying for, I think it was um, MBAs, and he put them into different workshops over a very long period of time, 10, 15 years or so. And he studied what are the personality types that make a high performing team. And his argument basically was that you need a mix of personalities to be able to do that. So whilst having common purpose is really useful, um, if you if you're overly homogeneous, i.e. you all think the same and behave the same and so on, you may not perform mm -hmm. as highly, actually, as having a, a, a broader, more mm -hmm. diverse and inclusive. So I would, I would consider, this might be just language, Julian, mm -hmm. I would consider sometimes celebrate diversity mm -hmm. and inclusion and but help build an environment to your point julian where everybody has access to that learning and everybody can therefore learn in a constructive and homogeneous fashion you know that everybody has the the opportunity to you know to learn and improve so what a great question that's really got us thinking thank you very much indeed <laughs> um julian uh, so let's move on i can see charlotte actually we got a lot of questions so we may need to pick up the pace a little bit panel if we're going to cut through all of these thanks nick the next question is from a live linkedin viewer dr sharif can online teaching be a full-time job Okay. All right. Very good. Mark, why don't you start us off and then we're going to go and hear from Rachel next. Well, yes, of course it can, but that doesn't mean that you are 24-7 uh, online teaching. Part of that teaching online is getting prepared, zooming into the background of your participants, uh, trying to find out different ways of presenting 
the same uh, models or technology or, or theory and come up with new questions so people can learn together. Yeah, thank you very much. You did. I, I do find um, that you need time for yourself. You know, you need to recharge your creative mm. batteries. You know, even lithium iron phosphate does need to get out in the sun a little. Get yourself a solar panel, mm. a mental solar panel that you can go and recharge yourself and your creativity with, because otherwise mm. you will run out of that mm -hmm. um, that energy that you need to be able to put in. Mm. Rachel, your thoughts, and uh, then we'll hear from John. Uh, yes, yeah, so absolutely, it can become a full-time job. Um, but as the others have said, I do think you need to make sure that you, you know, build in that time for yourself. Um, and also as well, consider the fact that um, online teaching does not have to be delivering um, courses and workshops. So part of my role at Provec um, is alongside the training that we deliver for our um, project management apprenticeship is I have a, a skills coaching role as well. So I will have regular one-to-ones with all of our apprentice learners. Um, and each of those one-to-ones are a learning opportunity and, you know, a coaching and development opportunity. So, you know, you don't have to necessarily necessarily be delivering workshops um, all day long you know there are other ways that you can be um, teaching and developing skills yeah it's certainly mm -hmm. true isn't it and now you know if we think back to our university days it wasn't all lectures you know these little groups that came together where actually you know you explored the subject much further and the value in that was absolutely fabulous wasn't it do you remember those days they were really really great okay so about 100 years for me ago but bev <laughs> it's a lot lot closer <laughs> um, in your lifetime john we're going to come to you next and then we'll hear from bev yeah, just very briefly, I think there is this key issue of continuous professional development, which needs to be taken really seriously, because if you as a teacher want to remain credible with your learners, you need to be very mm -hmm. clear about current developments in the sector you're talking about or the subject you're talking about. So you need to build some time in for that. Now, if your employer is prepared to pay for that, that's absolutely great, but often they're not. So I would never personally do online teaching hours a week i think that would be soul destroying for me but i, I accept that everyone's different mm -hmm. but um, be careful that's all i would say yeah yeah thank you very much john it, you know our own cpd is critical isn't it and that's why these mm -hmm. sorts of sessions are so important to give us that little bit of spark that says oh that, that's a good idea i'll go and look at that i'll find out about this and so on bev your thoughts please yeah, most definitely. Um, you can be a, a, a full-time trainer um, virtually or, or, you know, just, just blended as well. Um, and I do agree with everyone that uh, the comments that we've said. Um, it, it's really important if, if you uh, – the question I would ask you is why do you want to only be um, virtual? Um, because you don't want to be locked away in a room um, and not actually getting any of those um, – social skills and, and the keeping up to date with the, you know, current ways that we do things. And um, I would say before you go down that path, make sure you've really mastered the art of how to facilitate so that you can ensure that you keep yourself fresh and, and therefore you're keeping your training fresh as well. So, I, but I would ask you to ask yourself, why do I only want to do virtual training? Is it the right thing for mm -hmm. me? Yeah, and I and I think that you're you're so right. You, you know, when an artist begins working, say in pencil, and then moves to watercolor, and then to oil, and then to sculpture, and so on, it's because mm. you know there's something extra in that other medium. You know, there's a third dimension mm. to be worked on here, and you know, virtual education and training is fantastic. It can do a whole range of different things, but um, honing your craft face-to-face -face is also an incredible experience and can augment you know, that considerably if you really think about it. So very good. Thank you so much indeed. Let's jump across to social, if we can, please. And um, we'll just have a little look at a couple of the comments that have been coming in from the group who are online. Um, NASA, thank you so much for talking to us um, about what you've been um, experiencing kind of through the show. We'll come to some of yours in a moment. Sheila, great to have you joining us from Johannesburg. And uh, also, Analia, 
uh, all the way from Argentina as well. It's a truly global audience that we have today. Mm -hmm. um, Irene jumping in from South Africa. Um, very good. Thank you. It's a little bit cooler in South Africa at the moment um, than uh, I think it probably is for uh, Neuros over there in Syria. So thank you for joining. Um, one of the things that um, I was kind of noticing um, in the chat today is how engaged everybody is. And if you've not had the opportunity to rewind the video, okay, after the live stream and just look at some of those chat comments, because there's a lot of value. And thank you, NASA, for sharing some of your thoughts, you know, with us um, on the panel as well. And finally, uh, for this section anyway, Mohammed, who's joined us from Afghanistan. So really good to have you um, with us, uh, Mohammed, living the bridge uh, that you're on there. I think it's a bridge anyway, that you may be standing on in your profile photo. Thank you. Um, let's move on, Charlotte, because we're coming up to towards the end of the show. We'll take our next question, please. Thanks. I think this might be a question from one of our panelists, Mark. What's the best thing on being a trainer? Okay, now, Mark, with your patience, I would, I'm going to rephrase this, okay? So I'm going to actually put okay. this to the panel. And with your patience, I'm going to come for you to you last, actually, on this. All right? <laughs> so I'm going to put, I'm going to insert a word here, okay? I'm going to insert the word you, panel, okay, into this. So what's the best thing you as a panelist on our panel today. So you, Rachel, I'm going to come to you, Rachel, first, mm -hmm. all right? And then I'm going to come to Mark okay. and then to Bev and so on. So, Rachel, what's the best thing for you being a trainer? Um, the best thing for me is constantly meeting new people at all sorts of different stages and times in their career. Um, and because of that, I never stop learning either. I'm always learning um, from my learners. Um, and I think, you know, you sh it's, it's good to, you never stop being curious. Uh, if every day is different. Every course is different. Even the material is the same. The people are different and that will always make it a different dynamic. And yeah, you, I'm, I'm a people person, so I love it. That's absolutely, that really shows as well. And um, thank you, because I really feel that. That's really kind of passionate from the heart, isn't it? Uh, Bev, your thoughts on what's the best thing for you about being a trainer? Um, it feels like you can give back, you know, so it is a lot of fun. It's hard work. It's a lot of fun. Um, you can just be yourself, you know, and, and you can um, let your personality shine through. Um, you do learn from others. You, you, um, they can bring the best out of you. You, um, I know, I, it, to me, it's actually the fact that you can give back. You've got this experience, you've got this knowledge, and um, you, can, you can share that with people and you can see them growing, you can see their minds um, moving in the breeze and um, you know you know that you've you've inspired someone to go and and stretch themselves or to be curious or to try and do something else and um, it, there's just such such a sense of self satisfaction that you can that you can get from seeing people um, embracing some new information and some new learning and, and knowledge so I just love it very uplifting isn't it really really uplifting i totally agree <laughs> really um Mar yeah mart mart your thoughts and then we'll mm -hmm. come to mark who asked the question fully recognize the previous answers and uh, absolutely so true uh for me what's also really rewarding is uh when people print out the uh, course materials and i encourage them to say to uh, place sticky notes you now sticking out of the course material as in this is a takeaway or this is my to do going forward and you know how they start having sticky notes sticking out at the top and then after day two it's as in well there's no room left so let's start on the side and after three days it's on the bottom as well so then the sticky notes are sticking out everywhere in other words mm -hmm. that's the one really rewarding feeling yeah, <laughs> it really is, isn't it? Because they are annotating, you know, and bringing mm. back to life those moments of truth, you know, throughout where, mm. you know, they kind of run out of highlighted pen almost. So, yeah, I completely okay. agree with that. Now, Mark, you you asked the question, um, mm. what is the best thing on being a trainer? And what would you like to add to our thinking? human beings, interacting with them on all different levels you can, helping them, seeing them grow and being part of that and growing yourself as well. 
sharing your energy. And at the end, if you're lucky, you get paid as well. So, <laughs> best job ever. <laughs> Yeah. I, I was I was about to say it, it can sometimes be modest. I think it is often spoken of as a vocation. And um, if you know British English, in our culture, a vocation just really means that um, it's a great, it's a really valuable thing that you're doing, but we're not going to pay you very much. So, um, so yeah, so there you go. But um, some really great advice. Um, f- for me, I would say... Um, Early in my career, I suppose I imagined as a trainer, you should have all the answers, okay, that, that, that you should know everything. And I quickly found out, because I learned from others, that really your role is to ask better questions. And then over time, the, the group will help you figure out the answers that they need mm. instead of the answers that you may have pre, pre-cooked you know, education, true learning and development is not always to have, you know, a pre-baked ready meal answer. Okay. Not always. Mm-hmm. A lot of the time it's about getting down to the raw ingredients and creating something delightful and new with the group. All right. Excellent. Very good. I think we can take our final question, um, Charlotte, if we can squeeze one more in. Panel, we're going to have to be fairly brief on this one. Thanks, Nick. A question from Holly in Manchester, UK. How do I start my career as a trainer? Okay, Rachel, start us off on this one, please. How do you get going? Um, I would say start small. Um, Maybe try to get involved in events, delivering a workshop or um, co-deliver with somebody um, to get some more experience and just, you know, start to get yourself known, start to get yourself out there, go and get some of those qualifications because they do help. Um, But network and, and, you know, just do as much as you can to, to sort of hone your craft, really. Okay, thanks so much indeed. Great advice. Uh, final thoughts on this because we're running out of time. Um, yep, yeah, definitely. Um, pick the field that you would like to move into and um, identify your actual delivery skills and, and how you deliver. So um, maybe mm-hmm. at home, um, do something, do, you know, do a um, video yourself um, explaining how to, you know, make a cup of tea or something very simple. Watch it back. See how you go. How can you actually improve yourself so that you can um, get a little bit more polished and then start, um, as Rachel said, a lot of all of those things that we've that we've covered as well about um, finding mentors, speaking to people um, about what it is to be a, a trainer, um, seeing where there might be a niche for you to fall into. Um, but just um, it, you just take a lot of work. Speak to speak to trainers, find a mentor, and um, just take yourself out of your comfort zone. Okay. All right. Thank you very much indeed. That comfort zone is quite interesting, isn't it? If you remember the cycle of, you know, kind of unconsciously being incompetent. Mm. So you're really bad at mm. something, but you just don't know it. And then you move into the next <laughs> the next stage. Oh yeah. You find out just how bad you might be. <laughs> okay. And those are good precursors. We all go through them for learning okay in my um in my culinary skills i've got plenty of evidence of that moving from the unconsciously incompetent of being able to cook something through to the oh my goodness that does not look like the picture in the book a learning moment available to me all right very good panel thank you so much it's been an eclectic episode um today so let's hear your closing remarks let's walk around the panel um rachel uh we'll come to you first and then we'll hear from bev Uh, so yeah, I have really, really enjoyed today. Um, as always, learned you know lots from my um, co-panelists and also lots from the questions that people have been asking as well. So it's always a joy to get involved in in these events. Um, and yeah, I just wish all of you absolutely the best of luck in your careers. Um, and you know, get in there and have a go. Absolutely, thank you so much indeed, Rachel, uh, Bev, and then Mart. Um, myself too. I, I, this, when I saw this come up, I was just like, oh, I really want to be part of this. Um, it's not for everybody. Find out your own delivery style. Um, learn from others. 
Um, that's how I, I um, fine-tune my facilitation style. I, I saw someone facilitating and I thought, oh, I just love the way he's knowledge sharing. So, um, you know, invest in looking at yourself, get yourself someone who really honest and give you some feedback and um, just enjoy it. You'll, you won't look back. You will not look back. Okay, thank you so much indeed. Really good advice there. Um, Mart and then Mark. Some great questions and great answers, like indeed, a uh, great show. Um, like to finish with a, a quote from Pablo Picasso, who once said, the meaning of life is to find your gift. The purpose of life is to give it away. <laughs> <laughs> these, are, these are really good. We, Mark, we, we need a book, okay? Um, if there are any yeah. publishers <laughs> online today, all right, Mark has authored a number of technical papers. <laughs> He's done a whole variety of different things in different communities, but I can feel a new ISO standard, uh, 99,004, okay, <laughs> which is going to be on Mark Rover's quote. So, um, yeah, good idea. Uh, thank you so much. Really, really great. Great contribution as ever. Thank you, Mark. Um, Mark, final thoughts, please. And then we'll go to John. Yes, great show. Uh, great questions today. Uh, um, love the quotes from uh, Mark, of course. And um, if you want to be a trainer, ask others if they could see you as a trainer and ask them for advice. Oh. What a great thing, isn't it? You know, um, because we sometimes don't recognize our own talent. You know, sometimes it needs someone else to kind of say, oh, yeah, I think so. And, you know, by the way, what about that? You're really good at the go on. And you say, oh, no, no, I couldn't really do that. And then, yeah, there you are, 10 years later, doing it brilliantly. So we all need that kind of thing. <laughs> really great thoughts. Thank you so much. Uh, John, final thoughts on today's show? I think when I did my teacher training in my 60s, there was a real issue about imposter syndromes where people didn't have the confidence mm. to feel that they could do it. And you can. Mm. Um, mm. I think a good teacher helps their students understand the right questions to ask in any given situation and where to find the answers. And if you do no more than that, surely you've helped hugely. <laughs> absolutely right absolutely right thank you so much um indeed um charlotte uh an amazing show i think we kind of went through it at the rate of knots you know so it's hard to kind of pack everything in today um your thoughts on today's episode thanks nick it's been a really enjoyable episode today i've really enjoyed it i think my dad might be watching today's episode and the reason why i mention this is that my sister is a teacher and I think one of the reasons why my sister is a teacher is because she she's able to impart her knowledge and, and help that person grow into the person that they want to be. And you on the panel today are doing the same thing. And it's such an amazing feeling from what I get from my sister, that the responsibility mm -hmm. and joy of doing that. Thank you so much for being on the panel and thank you to our viewers for such amazing questions. I think we didn't have time to ask to answer a live one, Nick. Yeah, I agree. And I'm looking at it and I'm so sorry, Oliver, to Oliver Stein, who put in a question. It just came that little bit late, Oliver. So my apologies, my friend. We are going to carry that one over and we will um, also send it to the panel for their thoughts as well and see if we can't get an answer for you. OK, so um, PM, uh, Talent Management, could you just private message Oliver and um, see if we can get his email address and then we'll be able to give him an answer uh, directly. OK, so we will do that. So thank you very much, Oliver, for your contribution today. We really do appreciate it. Thank you on behalf of the audience to the panel. Great job, um, everybody. Thank you, Charlotte, for doing all of the work that you've been doing. Um, I want to kind of move on a little bit, um, if I may. Over on the APMG website, you can, of course, search for the answers to all of the previous questions submitted on a variety of shows, whether it's the Level Up series that you've watched today or indeed our video case studies which are called Connect, the Connect series, or our one-to-one C-suite interviews that are hosted by our CEO and the podcasts that are available online from those. So do dip into that resource. It's a fantastic way to connect with experts. Don't forget, 
you can listen to the audio versions of all the APMG shows on your preferred podcast platform. Just search for APMG International. If you've enjoyed today's session, tune in on Monday at 8 a.m. in the UK time zone as we explore how to make the best use of artificial intelligence, a very um, topical topic actually at the moment. And on Tuesday, if you happen to be physically in London here in the UK, do go along to the Agile Business Products event, which is talking about the latest trends in project management. Doubtless AI will appear there. And then here um, on our final Level Up event for June, for the month of June, we're going to be looking at securing your future with better project delivery on Friday the 30th at 2 p.m. Um, UK time to do join us for those. Um, subscribe to the show, of course, and we'll send you a personal summary on a weekly basis of what's coming up next and how you too, of course, can join us here on the panel and level up your career with APMG. Thanks very much, everybody. Have a great weekend.